Well, first of all, I would like to thank Michael, Dan Adler, Rabbi Naomi Levy, because if it wasn't for them sharing my story, I wouldn't be here. And after listening to all the wonderful speakers today, it truly is a real honor for me to be asked to speak here. You know, as my wife and I, we were sitting here listening, we said, what in the heck am I doing here? I'm not an inventor, I'm not a photographer, I'm not a musician, I'm not a singer, you know, I'm just Dr. Bill. But I've been asked to share my story, and it does have something to do with vision. Throughout all of my life, vision has truly been such an important part of my life. I grew up a third-generation Japanese-American living out there in the suburbs of Los Angeles. And in that particular town, every day after school, all the kids, we would get together, all the kids in the neighborhood, we'd get ready to play baseball, and every single day, I was the last one to be picked. It never failed. Why aren't you as good as your brother David? You're terrible. We'd rather not even have you on our team. But everything changed when a doctor fit me with glasses. With those glasses, suddenly I had power. No longer did I have to stay inside the classroom during recess to copy those spelling words. When we had math quizzes, I could see the difference between a plus and a division sign. And most importantly, I could finally hit that ball. No longer was I the last person to be picked when we played baseball. Just the second to the last, but it wasn't the last. <laughs> so since that time, I made a goal of becoming an eye doctor. I said, you know what? I'm going to be the first one in our family, the first one in our entire clan to go to college. I studied my hardest. I went to UCLA, and eventually I did become a doctor. I opened up a practice in Santa Monica, California that just specialized in kids. I felt that there really weren't enough doctors who took the time to evaluate kids. And more importantly, I thought that it was important that children, especially kids who had special needs and those kids who couldn't talk, would have somebody who could evaluate their vision. So I developed a lot of different types of special techniques where we could evaluate children who are nonverbal, children who are deaf, kids with autism. We were able to identify whether or not their visual problems were contributing to many of their behavior problems as well. We saw kids with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome, and we were able to correct their eye muscle problems so that they no longer saw double vision. And this was something that helped with their overall motor development. But the greatest percentage of my patients were those who had vision-related learning problems. These were kids who had visual perception problems. They might see very clearly, but when they looked at letters, numbers, and words, they saw things backwards, or they were all jumbled together. So we worked with many of these kids and helped them to be able to read and to write and to excel at school. And within a couple of years, we became quite popular in the sense that many professional and Olympic athletes came to us because they wanted us to improve their depth perception, their eye-hand coordination, and their visual reaction time. It was something that was a dream come true to me. It was so interesting, too, because I was watching a baseball game, and I told my dad, hey, that's my patient. And he just <laughs> laughed. That's not your patient. <laughs> so within that time, <laughs> I then made this idea that there really needs to also be something for children who are legally blind. I went to the nonprofit center for the partially sighted, and I developed the first pediatric low vision center. We worked with kids who were born premature, kids who had cataracts, and these were kids who could no longer be helped by surgery. With these children, what we did is we developed specialized types of glasses. With these glasses, we could magnify the images up to four to six times, and we also developed different types of video magnifiers so that we could magnify the size of the books and the print on a computer screen so that even these kids who are legally blind could read. We also developed specialized types of telescopic lenses. And this was something that was very helpful for kids who were in middle, high school, and college so that they could see the chalkboard, they could see overhead transparencies, and for many of them, they even were able to drive. What I then found out was that for these children, there were so many things that we could do to help them. And my personal life was also developing just in the same way that I had planned for my professional life. 
my girlfriend June, she waited for me for nine years to finish doctor school, and we eventually we got married. We bought a small little house. We had two children, a daughter named Jamie, a son named Brett. We even got a dog. And my life was absolutely perfect. It was everything that I wanted. Every day that I went to work, it was something that I just really couldn't wait to go to see. It actually happened to be I worked seven days a week. That's how much I enjoyed this job. There was one special occasion that I remember. I had a family that was a very powerful family from Saudi Arabia. They came to the office. There were three limousines. It was almost like Eddie Murphy's movie, Coming to America. <laughs> Out of the first limousine, there were four bodyguards that searched the surrounding of the building. Next, four bodyguards came inside, and they searched every examination room, and then they called the parents to come in. This father, he carried his son. His son was about six months old, and following behind with her head down was the wife. He said, Doctor, could you please help me? You know, this is our only son, but there's something wrong with his vision. Some of our doctors at home told us that he has autism, and that's why he doesn't look. Other doctors at home told us that his eyes are fine, but we know there's something wrong. The mother then said, there's nothing wrong with his eyes. There's nothing wrong at all. He hates me. That's why he doesn't look at me. My baby hates me. And she started to cry. I could feel the tension in the air, and I then started to examine this baby. What I found was that this baby's eyes could only focus at a distance of about three inches. What I then did is I asked the mother, please, can you help me? Hold your baby. And at that time, I held some lenses in front of the baby's eyes. Immediately, this baby's eyes looked at the mother's eyes. Her eyes just filled with tears. She started crying and hugging the baby. The father hugged the mother. And it was a moment that I'll just never forget. I truly had the best job ever. But it all suddenly came to sort of an end. About the end of 2003, I noticed a blind spot in my left eye. I went to specialist after specialist, and each one told me that I had a retinal degeneration. Not only was it like macular degeneration, but both the rod and the cone cells of my eyes were dying. As a doctor, I knew this was something that the prognosis was very grim. But my wife, June, was kind enough to take me every day Every day, we went to every type of alternative medicine doctor that there was. I saw acupuncturists three times a week, I had an osteopath, a chiropractor, a homeopathic specialist. I saw a feng shui specialist where we tore apart our furniture in the home. I took intravenous vitamin therapy, intravenous chelation therapy. I had these Chinese herbs that had cockroaches and seahorses and goose livers, and I boiled it to a consistency of mud and I had to drink it, and it was the worst thing ever. <laughs> but still, even with all of that, my vision got worse. It got to the point where it looked as though I was looking through clouded wax paper in each eye. Every day when I woke up, I was even scared to see what it looked like because each day it got worse. It got to the point where I realized that my vision was coming to an end. I actually bought a machine a video magnification machine that could magnify the pictures 95 times. And I took every picture that we had, every photograph. I looked at each one and tried to ingrain it into my mind. I took every video that we had and watched every one of them sitting two inches from the TV, trying to get as much of an image as I possibly could because I knew that someday I would be totally blind. It was the hardest decision I had to make, though, when I sent that letter to my patients just announcing that I was going to be retiring. It was so hard just because all of my life, it was my goal to become a doctor. You know, over 20-some-odd years, I studied to become a doctor, and I had the best job ever. I was the doctor to the rich, the famous, the poor, the old, the young, so many different types of celebrities. And when I retired... I received so many kind letters. I received letters from some of my patients who had learning disabilities to tell me that they wanted to thank me because they're now in Harvard Medical School. Another boy who was legally blind, his name was Michael. People told him that he would never be able to go to college, and here he was at Stanford Law. I received jerseys and T-shirts from professional athletes who thanked me. All of these things made me feel good, but at the same time, 
it made me very angry. As a retired person, I was the angriest person that there could ever be. I didn't know what to do with my time. Everything that I knew how to do was related to vision. I couldn't go out and play golf. I couldn't play baseball. I couldn't play tennis. I couldn't drive. I couldn't even walk anymore. June would take me out to lunch. I would stumble over the curb. People would laugh. It was just such an embarrassing thing that I became secluded. All I could think about was, why did this happen to me? This is so unfair. Here I was doing the best that I can, helping people from all over the world, many times doing all of this work for free, and God would take this away from me. I lost my faith in God. I was so angry. At the same time that this was happening to me, my oldest brother David, you know, Mr. Everything. How can you not as handsome as your brother? How can you not as good as your brother? How can you not as smart as your brother? Mr. Everything, the nicest guy that I knew, suffered from a heart attack. And this was a heart attack that didn't have to happen. He had chest pains, and on three separate occasions, he saw doctors, and the doctors told him it was indigestion. But he eventually had a massive heart attack and lost 70% of the function of his heart. He was on a waiting list for a heart transplant list, and I was angry. I was so angry. I became such an angry person that I started to even take it out on June. One day, we were repairing a light in the backyard, and I couldn't see where to put the screw inside the hole, and I said something that I will regret for the rest of my life. I said, why didn't this happen to you? You should be the person who's blind. If you were blind, it wouldn't make as much of a difference because you're just a housewife. I knew I was wrong, but I was not enough of a man to even say I was sorry. And June, being the person she is, she didn't even kick me off that ladder. If, <laughs> if I was her, I would have kicked you off that ladder and put you on the ground. But the next morning, she woke up and she said, hey, let's take the kids someplace. Let's take them out someplace fun. I'm going to go and cook breakfast. Our daughter Jamie comes running into the room and she says, Dad, get up. We're going to the Long Beach Aquarium. I love that place. Hurry up. I said, Jamie, you know, just certainly not filling up to it today. Here's some money. Go buy some souvenirs and tell me about it when you come home. About a couple minutes later, my son Brett, he was about nine years old. He comes into the room. He says, Dad, Jamie's crying. You got to fix it. I go, what's the matter? She's sad because you're not coming with us. She said, when you don't come, it's not as fun, and you never come any place with us anymore. And I said, well, you know, Brett, I'm not feeling so well, and besides, I won't be able to see any of those fish. He says, Dad, you don't have to see the fish. I'll tell you what every fish is. I'll tell you the colors, and I'll even draw it for you on your hand. I smiled, and I said, thanks, but you guys go ahead. I thought he was going to leave the room, but he then hit me with a ton of bricks. He said, Dad, I know this is really hard on you, but Dad, it's not all about you. Your blindness isn't only affecting you, but it's affecting Mom, it's affecting Jamie, and it's also affecting me. All of us are sad. I didn't know what to say. That entire morning while I sat there by myself, I realized that I was ruining their lives. A year ago, we had the best life ever, and now... It was something that my marriage was probably falling apart, my kids were unhappy, and I was miserable. I tried to figure out, what could I do? But I tried every alternative type of remedy, and nothing helped. I needed to get my vision back. I didn't know where my next paycheck was going to come from. I didn't know what to do. I decided that I was going to commit suicide. I had it all planned out. There was a particular hill that was by my home, that the buses would come by and they would never see me and I planned on just running right in front of the bus. But I didn't have a way to leave my will or what I wanted to happen. I wanted to make certain that my family was taken care of. So I called up my brother Dave and I said, Dave, I need you to help me with something. You got to do something for me. He said, sure, anything that you want. Well, if anything happens to me, I want you to promise me that you're going to take care of Jamie, June, and Brett. I have this life insurance policy, and if I die, I want you to take the proceeds and take a quarter of it 
and I want you to buy two apartment buildings. I want you to take another quarter of it, and I want you to put it aside for the kids in their college and graduate school and help them with a down payment. Take another quarter of it, and I want you to invest it in gold. And the last quarter, I want you to take care of yourself, your mom and your dad. And if there's anything else that anybody else needs of our relatives, do it. He said, do you have cancer? What's the matter? I said, no, it's nothing like that at all. He said, you're thinking of committing suicide? That's the most selfish thing that I've ever heard in my life. If you commit suicide, you're going to scar the kids forever. How do you think they're going to feel when you're not there? Every day that they go to school, the kids are going to ask them, why did your dad kill himself? Every day that there's a school event where it's daddy and son, daughter and father, all of these types of events, they're going to be there by themselves. They're going to feel so left out. They're going to be so unhappy. You can't do that. I thought about what he said, and I realized that he was right. This was actually the short way out for me. I felt so guilty about it. I felt so guilty because I also knew that here he was struggling every day to try to live another day until he got his heart transplant, and here I was ready to give my life. I thought that afternoon, and I realized the problem that I had was that my blindness was truly making me blind. All I could think about was how sorry I felt my, for myself that I was losing my sight, that I had to give up my dreams, that I had to give up my goals. I decided I have to change from this point on. I closed my eyes to block off the ugly images that my eyes would send. As I closed my eye, I thought about my family. I started to visualize in my mind. I visualized June and Jamie and Brett at the Long Beach Aquarium, looking at the fish, laughing, I suddenly could see the jellyfish. I could see the colors. In my mind, through visualization, I realized that I could see things again. It's been such a long time that I was able to see, but it was like an addiction. I then started to visualize attending my son's sixth grade graduation, giving him a high five when he walked off the stage. I then pictured myself there at my daughter's wedding, walking her down the aisle. I realized at that point in time, that I may not be able to control what my eyes do, but I could control my mind. And with this, I could also see again. I realized at that point that vision isn't something that only occurs in the eyes, but it is something that happens within the brain. I started to visualize different types of goals and dreams that I had for myself. I started to learn how to use different types of equipment for the blind. I purchased scanning software so I could start to read my mail. I learned to use computers that talk to me. I purchased a cell phone that I could take a picture and it would read my currency aloud. I also then started to learn Braille. And one of the hardest things that I had to accept was to be using the stick. I was so embarrassed to be known as blind. But when I found the stick, it gave me all these other types of independence. And I started to learn to map out the room like this hotel by myself. I could visualize, I could memorize all of these types of things. And within a short time, my world started to change. I started to learn to cook. I wanted to be involved in my family's life. I decided that I was going to get up in the morning and make June her coffee. I made my kids their breakfast every day. And it wasn't until about six weeks later when they said, Dad, please, no more cup of noodle. No more <laughs> cup of noodle. But I felt good that I was able to participate. I felt like I was alive again, and my will to live and to pursue different types of dreams and goals came back. Things changed for me quite a bit. I was then asked to become the chief of staff at the Center for the Partially Sighted, where I counseled many of our different doctors, teaching the doctors to do what I did. I also then started a foundation, and this is a foundation that June and I raised Tremendous amount of money to help people, such as this young lady named Joyce. Joyce came to this country from Korea at the age of 12 because her mother had a dream for her. She had a vision that if she brought her to this country, she wouldn't have to be a fortune teller in Korea. Most children who are blind are either seamstresses or they're fortune tellers. 
Well, when Joyce came to this country, she had a natural talent to play the piano, and the New England Conservatory of Music offered her a scholarship. Well, Joyce, unfortunately, was about to turn down the scholarship because she didn't have the tools and the equipment to be able to read music with her fingers. But we found out about this young lady, and we were able to help her, and she's one step closer to achieving her dream of becoming a concert pianist. But what I enjoy most in my job today is just helping other people who are blind. I think that those who are going through vision impairment and blindness often have such significant difficulties such as I did. This is a young boy by the name of Josh. And when Josh was born, Josh was born with tumors in both of his eyes. He had to have one of his eyes removed, and the other, they were able to save it, but he had limited vision. Despite his very limited vision, Josh is a straight-A student. He has a twin sister. He's the greatest brother ever. He plays golf. His dream is to one day become the first visually impaired golfer to win the Masters. He also plays football. And Josh is just the greatest kid ever. The only fault that I could say for Josh is that he loves USC and not UCLA. <laughs> But I met Josh this November, and he came to my office, and I couldn't understand why this young man was coming to see me. I thought, maybe he needs some equipment. Maybe he needs a computer. He sat down with me, and he said, Dr. Bill, I want to know what it's like to be blind. I heard that you had perfect vision, and now you're perfectly blind. I want to know what it's like. And I said, well, let me tell you about this. When I first found out that I was going to lose my sight, I was the angriest person ever, and I was scared. But what I learned after I lost my sight was that virtually everything that I used to do, I could do it as a blind person. Blindness isn't bad. It's just different. I shoot baskets with my son. I play video games with him. I see more movies than I ever have in my life now that I'm blind. I can cook. I can repair things in the house. I could even drive when my friends are with me. <laughs> so I want you to know, Josh, that you can do anything that you want to do. And he said, Dr. Bill, next week the doctors are going to remove my remaining eye. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, but I really appreciate your help. We talked about some of his goals, and he did have that eye removed on November 12th. But within a week, he met his first goal. He returned to school. He said, I got to get back to school. I got to be with my friends. I don't want to go to a special school for the blind. A month later, he even played in the championship football game. I told him that other blind kids of mine played football. They played center. And Josh, he actually blocked his heart out at that football game. He then told me a, a couple of other things that came true with him as well. I told him that through my blindness, many doors opened up. Many opportunities, such as being able to speak at this conference, had opened up just because of my blindness. Well, he called me up on New Year's, and he said, Dr. Bill, I want to wish you a happy New Year. And just like you said, the doors are opening up for me. I've been asked by USC to do a public speaking engagement for their football team. Another football team has asked me to speak at their banquet. And in January, the headquarters of Wells Fargo have asked me to come and do a motivational speak. He said, you know, Dr. Bill, if you don't watch it, I'm going to start taking some of your gigs away. <laughs> but overall, what I've learned through my blindness is that Blindness is something that doesn't have to affect your life. With our eyes, we could see, but with our mind, we have vision. With vision, we could accomplish anything. We could see beyond the physical. We could see beyond what we've seen in the past and what we know. And with that type of visualization, we can actually explore, invent, and create so that we could continue to help mankind. For me... My blindness has made me definitely a better doctor because I understand what the patients are going through. It's made me a better professor because I can now teach my student doctors 
how that they should be able to react and respond to patients. But most importantly, my blindness has made me a better person. No longer do I judge people by the way that they look or the physical appearance. I'm not as impressed if you have that $2,000 watch or that $100,000 car. No longer do I lust to have those types of material things. And for the first time in my life, I could say that I'm totally content. If I may, I'd like to thank my wife, June, for giving me the support for all these years, being the best mother, being the best wife, and for not knocking me off of that ladder that day. <laughs> and I'd also, if I may, I'd also like to dedicate this lecture to my brother, David. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough um, to receive his heart transplant. And he always wanted to hear me speak. So I hope that today <clears throat> he's listening. And when you all have difficult days, you could think of a person like Dave. Even though he knew his days were limited, he lived each day to its fullest. And he taught me to forgive, to no longer to be angry, and to no longer to think of others. So God bless all of you, and thank you for listening. Peace.